Ja, meine sehr verehrten Damen und Herren, ich denke, wenn Sie Fragen haben, dürfen Sie die gerne stellen. Die Vorträge haben, glaube ich, das ganze Spektrum noch mal gezeigt, wo wir momentan sind. Es ist angefangen von der Gesundheitsökonomie über die Verbesserung, Vereinfachung von Systemen hin zu dem, was kommen wird, digitale Surgery, Digital Surgery. Das ist sicherlich ein Punkt, der die Zukunft bestimmen wird. Und ich sehe schon, ein Kollege ist am Mikrofon. Meine Frage richtet sich eigentlich an äh, Intuitiv. Wir sehen jetzt durch diese zahlreichen Vorträge heute, dass man inzwischen auch mehr Konkurrenz hat, dass neue äh, Maschinen am Markt kommen. Ich arbeite selber als Chef in einem Kommunalhaus und ich werde immer wieder mit Fragen konfrontiert, warum mache ich zum Beispiel eine Adenomonoklation mit Robot oder Sacrocolpexie? Das sind die Sachen, die in DRG nicht entsprechend abgebildet sind. Die Frage, die sich konkret jetzt an Sie richtet, ist, wie sehen Sie die Milka die Zukunft? Wird sie da in dieser Hinsicht was ändern? Oder ist es die einzige Milka, die über DRG durch Zusatzentgelte das zu regeln? Zeigen Sie mir, ich versuche mal die Frage zu wiederholen. Es geht um die Einbindung von niedriger bewerteten Prozeduren in die Robotik, wie wir das Zum Beispiel das um Kostensenkung von Intuitiv zum Beispiel auch. Das ja, also wir, ähm, wir wissen natürlich auch, dass, ähm, dass es gerade hier im deutschen Gesundheitssystem ähm, Prozeduren gibt, die ähm, in die heutige, Kost die heutige Kostenstruktur von robotisch assistierter Chirurgie nicht passen. Äh, dennoch glauben wir, dass in Kombination mit höher bewerteten Prozeduren die gesamte Auslastung der Systeme in einem maximalen Bereich auch dazu führt, dass niedriger bewertete Prozeduren mit heutigen Systemen sehr gut ähm, bedienbar sind. Wir haben Beispiele dafür. Ähm, das ist Status quo heute. Ähm, sicherlich werden sich ähm, auch Produktkosten über die Zeit ähm, eher nach unten bewegen und dann noch weitere Dinge öffnen. I do it in English. I think it's easier, particularly for the guests who only speak English. Um, I think I don't want to focus so much on the costs because when you ever think about, for example, pharmacology uh, pharmaceutical companies, Novartis <laughs> just came up with a product where just one treatment costs you two million euros. So what, we are, what are we talking about? Uh, it's just, it's the German system. But when we talk about the future, of course costs play a significant role, but what is really the future? And I think when you look in, into a robotic system or a digital robotic system, what I believe is the better, uh, better term for, for these uh, products, uh, we have one, one part which is extremely important, and this is the instrument. <laughs> and Mr. Klutmann, you showed some different approaches, for example, how to construct such an, 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 such an instrument. And the question is, is the instrument which we have right now is that the future we go, or is it something what, for example, uh, Mr. Barton showed us for the SP, where you have flexible instruments, or what do you think is what we are going to in the near future? Is it still something that is put into the human body via a trocar, or is it something that is moving inside a human body without any trocar? You just put it in. Is this something you can think of, Mr. Klotman, and what do the others Belief and how do we actually control this, whatever that is? Thanks uh, for, for this great question. Um, so I believe that, um, of course, so multiple port surgery and um, well, those slender instrument with those articulated tips is just um, a very first step in um, really um, putting full dexterity into the patient. The idea is to also work um, behind um, structures, behind organs, to bring um, really, well, with small axes, um, broad dexterity and manipulation capability into the patient. And, um, well, therefore, um, it will change, of course, um, but um, probably, um, well, from from research perspective, um, there are uh, still those trade-offs, and therefore I can't imagine that um, really multiple surgery with this um, way of currently um, articulating instruments um, will, um, well, uh, greatly change um, also in clinics um, in the next five to ten years. So I think that's a great question, actually, because there isn't a one-size-fits-all approach, is there, depending on where, where you're operating, the type of structures you're working on, the size of the structure, the amount of force you might need to, to put through an instrument. So actually, in my mind, there's a question is, for each surgery, is a hybrid approach 
a possibility going forward. Um, but then when you do have a hybrid approach, you rightly asked, how do you control such things? And I think there's a lot of work to be done there to, to find the right approach to controlling, to controlling a hybrid set of instruments. Um, and I don't have the answer to that, I'm afraid, right now. But something certainly to go away and think about as a community. Yeah, and I'd like, I'd like also to share our vision because, uh, first of all, great question. And what we believe is important is for every patient to get the less invasive treatment possible. On top, of course, the, uh, the clinical outcomes should be for granted. And what, what do we mean by that? So could be multi-port, could be single port, could be endoluminal, and could be genomina. So it's, we should, as, as technology companies, we should be able to equip you guys with what is the best treat possible treatment and less invasive treatment possible for that patient. So you should have all the option possibles. And of course, hopefully less than two million, because we, we know with, with a lot of money, Ferraris are, are really nice, but not everybody can drive a Ferrari. So we would like to take a look also into the cost. Of course, we have seen a lot of visions. Visions are always good. You need a vision in order to produce something, at first of all, in your head, and then, of course, um, actually something you can grab. And I have to say, unfortunately, the only vision that came to prove to be something that works is the intuitive system. And, um, of course, they further developed it to the single port, which we have seen yesterday, which I believe is the next step, probably also when it comes back to the instrumentation, to something that will be probably the future, probably not. It has to be proven that this is better than anything else, or it's better for f very special indications, for example. But the thing is, I think the first step you have to make is you have to show something that works. And then on top of this, like I like the distal motion thing because the approach is pretty clear. It's laparoscopy. You have a different approach. Uh, you are still working as a surgeon, as a surgeon you are used to because you are right beside the patient. And then if you have something complicated, you use your machine, your robot, or however you call that, or assistant or digital assistant, I don't know how one can um, explain it and, and yeah, use it. But this is completely different from what the others do, completely. I think it's very interesting to see and how it works, but <clears throat> for future developments, you have a certain level and then it will stop, in my opinion. Because at a very complicated procedure, for example, esophagus or esophageal um, surgery, you will not be able to use your system. But this is not the question because there are so many indications where you can use it, for example. But the thing is, you will have something pretty soon and it's already ready to use, more or less, that it can be used. So what I think is, what I would like to see is less visions and more something that I can grab. Use it, test it, and say it's good or not so good. Because the number one right now and that's what I see for the next couple of years is intuitive. I'm sorry to say that, but I think this is a clear statement from what I know from all the others of you. Thank you very much. Um, we should probably clarify that there's no conflict of interest here. <laughs> thank, you for your, thank you for your feedback. Um, we, we indeed take, sure, surgery will, will evolve over time, and there will be great things that people, not even on, on, in the vision statements today, uh, can foresee uh, as developments. But what we want to do is something that works today. Uh, it's building blocks. And, and if new technologies, new instruments, new ways of approaching surgery emerge and are proven clinically to be relevant for patients and from a health economics perspective, then we have a platform to which those instruments can be added over time. So we really take a, indeed a, a bottom-up approach. Get something out that works for everyday cases. And again, I also think, to your point, is, is it, um, Dexter is super modular, uh, and, and, and so do we see the market. There is, Dexter is not made for every single procedure. There will be cases where other solutions, uh, and also the existing Da Vinci, which I think is a great machine, will potentially be the better approach. But, but, but I think what we want to do is we want to approach all those laparoscopic cases today that do, yet, do not yet have access to, to, to the robotic benefits.
maybe a comment here from Intuitive. Um, we, of course, observe what's going on in the market. We, um, we understand the concepts of uh, implementing systems which have a more simplified uh, concept, which have uh, different um, thoughts on cost and um, yeah, try to compromise. And of course, we have about, um, from our 5,000 employees worldwide, about 1,000 are engineers. And this team, there are teams uh, which are every day working on different concepts, different ideas on how to make things better accessible for the biggest majority of, uh, of surgeons worldwide. And the discussion is, of course, in our company, should we come up with a compromised, cost-reduced solution, but our thoughts and our decisions always go back that the, to deliver the highest value, to deliver really solutions where you are able to um, perform complex procedures, and by doing that, trying to optimize uh, the usage, uh, trying to optimize the OR, and enabling you with those, um, those tools to also work on your uh, more easier cases is the better choice. And uh, in our organization is always a discussion on the comparison between our business and um, airplane business, for example. And um, both uh, businesses um, take care of of humans, of human lives, and uh, none of us want to be transported by a cheap airplane. So typically we try to um, be transported by the most secure and typically most expensive airplanes. And the only uh, way out of this is to use those planes in the maximum. And that's what's happening today. And these are part of the thoughts we have, why we are delivering the technologies as we do. I continue if nobody asks questions. Um, I have two more um, subjects I want to address to all of you. One question is, what do you think is the future in visualization? Have you ever thought about new concepts in visualization? Immersion, immersion, Mr. Klutmann. Is that a subject in the future? And how do the others look at uh, how the surgeon and the assistant surgeon and probably the nurse is going to see inside the patient. Is, is, is the, do you do some research in this particular subject? Of course. Um, so uh, I guess um, so. better vision is um, the one thing. Um, the um, improved information assessment and augmentation is the other thing. And therefore, we need to process um, the images very differently. And, and I guess we have also seen many approaches also of the other companies, um, how they're trying to do it. Um, but this is also something which is not easy to be done. So it's more or less machine learning, um, artificial intelligence, which uh, need to be used to process um, images in a way that we are also able to augment structures from preoperative data um, or, or intraoperative data um, to really do it. We need huge amounts of data and the data currently doesn't exist uh, for research institutions um, companies are working um, on their own institutions collecting this data and I guess that we need to rethink also um, the way we are all collaborating together to innovate things so maybe also um, well in, in the clinics there must be um, time um, um, yeah, for um, assistant uh, surgeons or maybe also for, 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 the, for the students to really annotate the data, to um, prepare the data such that we as researchers or maybe also companies can contribute to um, yeah, um, uh, make um, those, those visions really work in the future. Yeah, of course, this, uh, this is one point, but you see the, the question is we had this this morning and we were talking about simulation and how, how surgeons will be actually educated in the future. And uh, most of us believe, those who actually do the robotic surgery, that simulation is the future. And of course, with simulation, we are talking about artificial pictures. And the question is, when we combine both, are we really, I don't know if anybody ever proved it, are we really better in our surgery and what we are doing? see the unseen, augmented reality, etc., virtual reality and mixed reality because this comes together. And the question is, do we need a complete new approach? How to look at it? How do we understand what we see? Or do we have to, have to see what we usually see? Or do we have to have a complete new concept in order to understand what's going on, particularly 
um, if you want to look behind that, you all of a sudden see the picture from behind, but how does a human being actually is using this picture, which is completely weird, probably? I think it's not so far out. I think we see um, with the um, existing simulation devices uh, what, is, what is possible. Here we are getting additional information from artificial uh, in intelligence. Um, um, it's existing in those systems and the data which are in there is data generated by humans, generated by surgeons, and this information is available in the simulators. And of course, as you said, the next step is to bring this information as an additional decision support um, into the live systems. So that is one piece. Uh, the other piece is, of course, improving the visualization per se. So. Um, um, delivering additional wavelength information like firefly, delivering um, additional visual information like nerve or cancer uh, margins uh, into the optical fields. Uh, so here, um, multiple technologies are being merged in the view of the patients together. And of course, as I have uh, showed previously, um, the merge of uh, additional uh, visual modalities, MRI, ultrasound, CT pictures, everything in the live picture is, I think, the next step in visualization. Um, so uh, it's, 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 not, it's not far out. It's all existing technology. They have to be brought on one spot. And uh, to your comment, uh, data are available. Um, uh, here, of course, um, in-house generated information over many years is an advantage. And of course, those we have to use um, in our organization to, to make this next step. May I just add that there are, I agree, some really interesting things you can do potentially with vision, um, including sometimes some quite abstract things, which when you look at, you may look at it and think, I'm not quite sure I understand that, but could lead to optimizations and efficiencies. <clears throat> Part of the challenge, I think, isn't, isn't just the idea, the vision processing, but it's actually the human-computer interaction work which we do have people at CMR that look at. Because it's very easy to have an idea, to build something, to show it to people, and everyone to say, yes, that's great. I can see why it's useful. I can see how it's helpful. But actually, the next step from that, the, the showing that the, your interface with the system is the right interface, and that it is actually helping you and not hindering you, and it is actually making a difference, and doesn't inadvertently have those latent errors there that slip up that you wouldn't have had otherwise, and then building that into training, I think that's the real challenge, not the ideas, but the next steps from that. Well, yeah, it's, it's, a, it's a comment, it's not a good question, and uh, regarding what, what Pete said, I think we are, we are on the way, uh, as you already uh, also told, in a, in a journey to bring in additional information, which is very important for surgical procedures, and I, I see this coming, and uh, for sure, this is very, we, we have to think new, we have to think how we can get more information, relevant information for the surgeon, because surgery counts on understanding the disease, the anatomy, and the process. I think this was a nice conclusion of this, uh, this session, so I, in terms of time and lack of time, I think I, we would like to thank all of you presenters for your uh, special oral presentation. Thank you very much. Thank you.